I would like you to think about everything you see around you today. We know where it is. It's here. But how did it get here? The short answer is, well, you could say many different civilizations that have had an impact on our modern society. Rome, Greece, Egypt. Many, many different civilizations have had an impact on how we see the world today. But for now, we're going to go back even further. Further than Rome, further than Greece, and slightly further than even Egypt itself. But, instead of jumping right into civilizations, we're going to start just before the first towns, villages, and eventually the first cities sprung up on Earth. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, and welcome, one and all, to what I hope to be the first of many podcasts of our history series as part of the Grand Portfolio. And today, we're starting at the very beginning of civilization. But before we can step into civilization, we need to understand what came before. Now, as many of you will know, before the first civilization sprung up, the Ice Age had recently reached its conclusion, the most recent one that is, around the year 10,000 BC. Now, the problem with going back this far is that there are no written records, no documentation, no historians, just people, or more specifically, a type of hunter-gatherer people known simply as nomads. Now, these people would travel from place to place, hunting animals such as mammoths, and gathering food from the, from the wilderness and nature around them. Berries, certain herbs used as basic medicines or treatments, and also using the bones and skins of the animals they hunted for clothing and very basic and crude tools. Unfortunately, the main problem for us is with trying to study or look at these nomadic hunter-gatherers is that they left behind no written records of their existence. The only way to know that they even existed in the first place is through various sources of evidence, such as cave paintings that you can sometimes see all around the world today, um, for example, there are cave paintings in scattered throughout North America, and there are famous ones hidden in the caves of southern France. And not only that, but we also have the, ver the many tools and burial sites that they left behind for us. But other than that, we don't have an awful lot to go on regarding their lifestyle, their personal feelings toward their way of life, etc etc however this all began to change around 8000 bc so we're talking 10,000 years ago now the ice age had in the past 2000 years beforehand had recently come to an end and something known as the neolithic revolution among historians had begun to take place now this was where the hunter-gatherers that I have mentioned began to settle down and instead adopt a more based or grounded way of life, mainly centered around agriculture, having a permanent and reliable food source instead of just flitting about from place to place all the time. Now these mainly sprung up around areas where there were significant amounts of water namely rivers and from these rivers became the first towns and villages now these towns and villages were no more than simple hut houses close to fields close to rivers which just made it easier easier and more convenient for people to do their farming and as a result get their food however 
You may see agriculture and farming today as just a profession, just a part of the industry, another cog in the wheel of a country's economy. But back then, this was a revolutionary breakthrough. Because you see, hunting and gathering takes up an awful lot of your time. As anyone in the modern day world will tell you, once you get big tasks or everyday day-to-day -day jobs out of the way, such as, oh, I don't know, um, grocery shopping or ironing your clothes for the week or tidying up the house, you've suddenly got free time to do whatever the hell you want. In this case, with the time taken from the hunter-gatherer lifestyle, instead, agriculture helps keep a food supply in development and ready and wait, waiting to be used when needed. So they had a food supply, it was there, it was right next to them where they lived. And so there is less need for hunting and gathering and the, and the people I've been talking about can stay in one place. That is the Neolithic Revolution and it didn't happen at once, it happened gradually and spread across the entire world. Now there are six main places in on earth to note when talking about settling down in the Neolithic Rev Revolution. These are the land known as Mesopotamia in what is now Iraq and Syria in the Near East. Now the word Mesopotamia is interesting because it means between the rivers or the land between two rivers, namely the Euphrates and Tigris rivers of which still flow today, there are still people living there today obviously as you see cities such as Baghdad. Aside from this there was the civilization of the Indus River Valley in the northern area of the Indian subcontinent. Including this, there is also the Yangtze River civilization in modern day China. Also that of Mesoamerica, or in Central America, those known as the Maya, for example, sprung up in that region. Now that word Meso has popped up again, it means between, and you have America. So think of Central America, the region as we know it today. Mesoamerica, between the Americas, North and South. And finally, we have our last two. These are those of the Andes, which would eventually develop into the Inca civilization way further down the line. And finally, we have perhaps the most famous near the most famous civilization to emerge as a result of the Neolithic Revolution. This would be Egypt. However, just before Egypt, or around about the same time, we can't really be sure, the first city-states began to arise. Not in Egypt, not in the Indus River Valley, not in China, not in Mesoamerica, not even in the Andes. We're talking, of course, about Mesopotamia. Now, Mesopotamia lies in a region known as the Fertile Crescent. This includes both Egypt and Mesopotamia itself. It's an area where there were lots of waterways and rivers, absolutely perfect for setting up basic farming civilizations and communities. <clears throat> now, the thing to note about these basic towns and villages that first sprung up alongside the rivers the first of them that we know of being Jericho, which was settled in what is now the West Bank in around 8000 BC. These small towns and villages had no real structure or urbanisation to them. They were just houses all clustered together near the fields, near the farm, near the farmland and the rivers, just built for convenience. Nothing more, nothing less. And also for people to live in and shelter from dangerous animals in the night. Obviously, what else are houses for? So, there was no real planning or organisation to these settlements. 
until, however, the first two cities emerged. These were Uruk and Eridu. But before I go into a bit more detail about Uruk and Eridu themselves, I need to give you a bit of background geography about the region of Mesopotamia itself. Now, this region is particularly flat, there's not many mountains or hills, and it's open, just wide open space, cut in several places by the Euphrates and Tigris rivers, and smaller rivers which branched off of the larger ones. Now, because of the flatness of the land, this made the area, the entire region in fact, quite liable to flooding. Now, with the food surpluses that agriculture helped to bring about and introduce, these agrarian peoples suddenly had more time to think about the world around them. Now, this is crucial because it is the beginning of what we consider just basic thought and mindedness about the world around us. These floods that would happen in this river region would often be quite violent, resulting in flash floods. And the peoples that settled on these lands, they thought them that seeing as these events were completely beyond their control, they believed that perhaps an invisible force controlled these events and caused them to happen. Now you have the beginnings of what is thought to be one of the very first main religions or cults, if it were. There had been religion beforehand in the belief known as shamanism. Now this was where people would seek to appease certain spirits around them, nature spirits, lesser gods that controlled certain aspects of nature, and shamans or witch doctors would help people to stave off evil spirits. Now evil spirits is one of the things that people of the time before civilization used to blame illness on. Because of course if you had a pain in your head and you couldn't understand it, they would assume that an evil spirit had gotten into your body. That was just an example of religion before civilization. There's probably other variants, but of course, very few, little to no record, we can't really be very specific in that respect. However, with the beginnings of religion in Mesopotamia, we have one main god, known, simply known as Enlil who was the greatest god of what would be known as the Sumerian Pantheon. And this god was centered around storms, wind, and water. Because if you're in a farming community, a farming civilization, and a very well water-fed region, then the biggest things that are going to matter to you as a farmer are nothing more than weather and water. And as I said before, these first, these people in the first, in the first basic settlements or civilizations would blame unexplainable phenomenon on gods, such as Enlil himself. And so priests would be enlisted to try and appease the gods or try and carry out the will of the gods in order to try and stop floods and certain disasters from happening. Because of course, they couldn't control these events, they didn't know what caused them, and they simply couldn't explain them in more detail. I mean, cut these people some slack, they've just, they've just stopped wandering around, they're tired, they just want their food, and they've only just started thinking about things in a slightly more complex manner. So you've got to try and cut these people a little bit of slack. I mean, 
Well, we've got things like the uh, we've got things like NASA, NORAD, the World Health Organization. Of course, they didn't have things like that. So we've got to go a bit easy on them here. So and besides, let your ancestors treat them with respect. <laughs> anyway, so. These priests in settlements that would later become cities such as Uruk and Eridu would try to appease the gods and carry out their will. And through this, these small and basic religious organisations, temples, priesthoods, they became well respected and looked up to in the societies that they helped run. Because of course, they were a direct contact between the gods and the people themselves, and therefore the community itself. And so, seeing as these religious groups and organisations were more or less the only steady contact that people would have with the gods, and the only ones who would know the will of the gods, and therefore they were regarded more or less as we regard scientists today. The people with all the knowledge, the know-how and the information. And in that respect, the priesthood or temple organisation would become a centre of control. They would tell people what to do in order to avoid floods, they would tell people when to plant, where to plant and what to plant in order to minimise the anger of the gods because there is a part of Sumerian myth that states that Enlil, the chief god of the Sumerian pantheon, one day humanity made too much noise whilst this god was trying to take a nap. And we've all been there, we hate being woken up from naps. I'm no exception. but. The thing is, I don't send floods to wipe out humanity when I get woken up from my nap. Yeah, this guy was irritable to say the least. So that is exactly why the priests and temple organisations existed. However, the priests themselves would therefore have jurisdiction over a small town or settlement because they could be in control because of the position they had with the gods and through this tax or tribute could be collected from the common folk in order, in order to appease the gods or just because somebody was uh, a bit greedy and just wanted maybe some new silk curtains but um Anyway, um, these taxes helped build up surpluses of certain materials such as um, wheat, other ingredient, and other ingredients for food. I'm talking mostly about food surpluses here because the problem is with Mesopotamia is that apart from agriculture, apart from food, apart from crops, it's not really a very resource rich area. I mean the only real building materials I, p I suppose you could have from that kind of area would be maybe the reeds surrounding the rivers or the sand in the ground itself in order to help build sandstone or mud bricks. And so this is where trade comes in. And with these food surpluses, the um, cities of Mesopotamia would engage in trade with other nearby settlements. For example, they could get materials not really found in, in Lower Mesopotamia, Southern Mesopotamia, for materials that are more abundant to the far north, nearer the sources of the Euphrates and Tigris rivers. Not at the actual sources themselves, but just further north, closer to the beginnings of the rivers. Now in these areas could be found tin, copper, stone and wood. 
perfect for building perfect for building and this trade and income of new materials allowed for new industries or basic industries to develop mostly mostly based around craftsmanship and therefore in the centers that gradually were becoming more urbanized as we know them today such as Uruk and Eridu these industries developed and they were pretty basic nothing complex like you see around you today you had that of weaving metalworking carpentry and of course agriculture the first which was more or less the first real the first real industry shall we say and through this Uruk and Eridu is the first cities and where they were based in order to give off surpluses of food to other nearby settlements became centers of trade and therefore administration and trade and administration, the thing is, you've got to keep track of literally everything. And how do you do that? That answer is simple. Yep, your teacher was right unfortunately. I hate it too, but it's necessary. Mathematics. This was developed at first in response to the first businesses and the blossoming trade to, between Uruk Eridu and other city-states that would eventually spring up, these being that of Lagash, Nippur, Ur and later on Akkad. Keep an eye on Akkad because we're going to come back to it later. For now though, mathematics was developed as a way to keep track and keep count of the food surpluses that were produced in southern Mesopotamia and also to keep track of goods coming in, being imported. Because this was how people would at first assess the value of a certain good, how much they needed of another good, and how much they could afford to give away, i.e. their surplus. In fact, this system of trade and business gave birth to basic accountancy Now, we have evidence of business transactions taking place in southern Mesopotamia within the Fertile Crescent. These pieces of evidence come in the form of messages or symbols or perhaps tallies, if you can call it any of those, scratched or etched onto stone or clay tablets. This perhaps one of the first known instances of written language and communication known as cuneiform or suniform depending on how you'd like to pronounce it was basically made up of symbols representing representing sounds or objects or actions just etched onto a stone or clay tablet this form of writing and communication began with the basic form of accountancy that I've talked about, keeping track and tallying trade and business in the first city-states. This form of writing began to appear in Mesopotamia around the late 4th millennium BC, so now we're talking around 6,000 years ago. These are the first records of written information that we have, so now we're moving away from cave paintings or just word of mouth passed down from generation to generation. The oral or word of mouth method of um, keeping and recording information having actually been seen in use rather recently, up until rather recently in fact, in certain parts of the world. As for writing however, as a trade, business and industry blossomed among the first civilizations throughout the world, they too would begin to write down, note and record in order to keep track of trade, business and general administration 
However, they would go to de- go on to develop their own unique forms of writing apart from cuneiform of Mesopotamia. The Egyptians, for example, as we very well know, having developed the hieroglyphic system of writing. But, of course, we'll come back to them later on down the line. I'd actually like to do a whole, perhaps, podcast series on the Egyptians themselves because, as we all know, they deserve one. Anyway now, back to the point. With trade blossoming throughout the Mesopotamian region, the peoples living there would eventually come into contact with other groups of people up and down the Euphrates and Tigris rivers, also further out into what is now the Iranian Plateau and around the Persian Gulf, and eventually into into contact with the civilizations of the Indus River Valley themselves. Now, this trade put them in contact with peoples who were aware of, harvested and used certain resources that were unavailable to the people of Sumer as the region with all the city-states of Uruk, Eridu and Lagash, for example, presided in. Now, as for the people of Sumer, as the region is known, certain resources were difficult to come by, namely tin and copper and other metallic materials. However, there were peoples further up the Tigris and Euphrates, near what is now considered modern-day Turkey. They knew how to get copper and tin And then you have the first instances of metallurgy and metalworking. Now, of course, I've mentioned the time before civilization. Man used stone tools. It was a step up from being apes swinging in the trees. However, a step up from that, as you may know where I'm going here, is that of the alloy known as bronze. This was the first time that man had attempted metalworking, and through combining tin and copper, you could create quite a sturdy and quite useful material, much better than stone for carrying out certain tasks such as carpentry, agriculture, and weaving, because, well, as you may know, stone stone is blunt. I mean, even if you sharpen it as much as you can, it's still nothing compared with the sharpness, durability, and just overall useness of metals. Now, there is evidence to suggest that metalworking began in what is now modern day Turkey, or what is generally known as Anatolia, around 6500 BC. This coincided perhaps a little later with what we see as the first uses of basic scratch plows, pulled by perhaps domesticated oxen at the time. This made farming a lot quicker and easier and required a lot less manpower and labour. Now, with even more free time on their hands, the Sumerian peoples began again to think and innovate. So, Let's recap over Sumer and the Sumerian city-states so far. We've got a religion based around gods that cause floods and storms, such as Enlil, chief of the pantheon of the Sumerian gods. We also have a basic form of government in the priesthoods that communicate with and carry out the will of these gods in order to appease them. We also have a basic economic system based largely around food surpluses which enabled trade with other lands further along the rivers or further out into other lands. We also have 
writing in order to keep track of business transactions, trade, and basically all the stocks of food and crops you have. Now, let's go back to mathematics for a second. Now, I've mentioned before we have mathematics now for mainly working around business, trade, how much you have, the value of something, how much you can afford to export, and how much you can potentially import. Now let's go one step further to geometry. Now, geometry is an incredibly useful piece of knowledge because it concerns the shape, size, and relative position of figures or perhaps buildings, or road networks, streets, towns, cities, wherever they are on the globe. And you can see obviously where I'm going here. With geometry in their hands, the Sumerians could now build more sophisticated buildings. Now we're getting somewhere. Well, we were getting to places already. I mean, in fact, what I've said already is just a huge step up from wandering around the world just looking for your next meal. I mean, come on. May seem basic to all of us here today, but back then, this was all monumental. Now, back to what I was saying about more sophisticated buildings. People, of course, back then wanted to appease the gods in order to keep their favour and keep them from, let's say, sweeping away their cities because of an interrupted nap time. Of course, we, we start to see more grandiose, more beautiful, more detailed buildings popping up. Temples, towers, great city walls. And don't look now but what we could potentially have on our hands are the foundations, the very first building blocks of the cities, systems, trade, administration, economies that you see around you today. So, let's come back to a sort of timeline here. It's 3000 BC. 5,000 years ago. The cities of Uruk and Eridu were founded around 5000 BC. So we've come an incredibly long way since just being hunter-gatherer peoples to now living in these big, glamorous, detailed, grandiose cities that before never even existed. And so, let's make things a bit easier for our Sumerian peoples now. But at this point, how do you make things easier? No, don't say the internet. None of that yet, we've got a bloody long way to go before we get there. Okay, sorry about that. So, how do we make things even easier for our peoples? That is with timekeeping. Not just minutes, seconds, hours, but I'm talking more on a larger scale, I'm talking days, weeks, months, and eventually years. Until in around 2700 BC, in the region of Sumer, we have the oldest known instance of a calendar. These basic calendars were based around the movements of the sun and the moon, their positioning. And these calendars, like everything, like everything in Uruk, Eridu, Lagash, Nippur and Ur, everything in Sumer was based heavily on agriculture. At the beginning, a year started and ended around the harvest season. So then people knew exactly when to plant their crops for the next year and when to harvest that very same year's crops. Now for the first time we have documentation with dates. Finally we can begin to move past just using carbon dating to 
speculate and guess when the when these certain things happened well in its basic sense you have dates but it's a step up things are getting more complex until in around 2400 BC we begin to see a different way of recording dates and events instead of just telling people when to plant their crops and measuring time that way we begin to see the recording of what is perhaps the first historical events perhaps the first instance of historians beginning to write things down not just their administration their business their trade but social events and now we're talking about their leaders their governments what they did what they did with other neighboring communities and this way of recording certain events is known as a royal year so okay I'm going to use a vague example all right so imagine you're a king and you do something rather significant in a specific year that year will then become known as the year that you did that specific thing so okay this is going to be a bit of a crude example so say one year you decide to get a pet goldfish suddenly that becomes the year that you got a goldfish that is how the year is known it's not in the sense that we can that we read and tell years today it's not in a numerical fashion it's more in a it's more in a written literate fashion and speaking of literature now that we have these complex societies beginning to emerge we have literature perhaps one of the very very first instances of a piece of written literature is a famous story known as the Epic of Gilgamesh who we're not sure if Gilgamesh was a real person the story that is told surrounding him is incredibly mythical it's about his quest for immortality and instead of living forever King Gilgamesh instead found immortality in having a legacy the things he did would be remembered forever of course it's a bit spotty but history is how history is things get lost all the time or just certain people were uh, hoard information but let's not get any further into that before I get grilled anyways back to the point let's backtrack just a little bit and go back to what I said about the first basic governments and administration based mainly about on, around priests because they had the know-how and contact with the gods however eventually an event happened in Uruk we're not sure what it was however we begin to see a slight decline in Uruk's growth we're not sure if it was a result of droughts invasions from outside peoples wanting the now apparent wealth of the city but after this decline we begin to see the end of the hegemony of the city-state of Uruk it's still an important city don't get me wrong but its priesthood, the control religious figures had over the administration, planning and governance of the city-states of Uruk, Eridu amongst others begins to disappear and is instead replaced with the first kind of basic form of dynastic rule rule in which somebody becomes a king or a leader 
and then they pass it down to their descendants. As you can see in the monarchies around the world, which still exist to this day. So that's one thing from, from Sumer's legacy that you can add to the pile of things that, that still kind of affects us to this day. But now going back to how the first monarchies began. So around the end of the third millennium BC, we see an event that more or less ended or silenced the massive amount of influence that the city of Uruk had over the Mesopotamian region. Now, not direct control, influence. There were no empires at this point, just city-states and maybe a few crude kingdoms. Now, we're not sure how this happened, or what in particular happened, but Uruk appears to have been raised around the year 3000 BC. And it's not until 2900 BC that we see things begin to pick back up. Now, at this point, Uruk had been rebuilt. Uruk stood once again, after, let's just call it, the event for now. But at this point, cities that had been established nearby began to compete with Uruk for influence. We're talking cities such as the ones I've mentioned earlier, Ur, Lagash, Uma, and Nippur. Now, these cities were led in the post-Uruk destruction power vacuum by warlords or military leaders that would lead their peoples or their various cities on campaigns against each other in order to acquire, for example, more land for farming or simply to hold more influence over a region, to cement their legitimacy over the leadership of an area or a group of towns or cities or peoples. But despite the destruction of Uruk, despite the end of its influence over a massive region, well, the end of its... Yes, I suppose you could call it that. The end of its domination of an entire region, not through force or direct control, as you see in recent empires. Yes, despite all of this, life still centred around one thing for the Sumerian city-states. Appeasing the gods as it would still remain the greatest, the thing of utmost importance of just life in general for thousands of years to come. So these military leaders, every victory they achieved, they would attribute to a certain god of the Sumerian pantheon. And this god <coughs> excuse me, would become the, the patron or the symbol or perhaps even the guardian of the city-state they represented. For example, the city-state of Nippur took the chief god of the Sumerian pantheon, Enlil, our irritable friend from earlier, as its patron god. The city-state of Ur took Nana, the god of wisdom and the moon as its patron. Uruk, however, took Inanna, the goddess of war and fertility, as its patron god, which kind of demonstrates how, despite the previous destruction of Uruk, it hadn't changed in the sense that religion was still very ideological dominant in the Sumerian way of life. However, these new kings, who at the time were known as Lugals, or literally great men, through having, through having demonstrated their power and might in battle, 
began to build for themselves houses of kings or palaces and these were built far bigger and far grander than that of the temple and this is where the temple begins to lose its political importance you see this is where the point in history where religion almost gets sidelined or sort of is on par with politics now and this is a theme that's going to pop up a lot as we go down the line from the oracles of Delphi in Greece advising the kings of Greece from also the uh, Protestant Reformation it comes in a lot for now though let's return back to Sumeria where we will begin now to focus on what was perhaps the the or one of the first instances of imperialistic conquest not empires we're not there yet but we're almost there now a Lugal of the city of Uma, known as Lugal Zagesi, ascended to the throne of the city. Now this city was fierce rivals with another city-state in the region that I've mentioned, known as Lagash. This Lugal, however, wanted revenge against the city for previous defeats detailed in the victory writings of the militarily dominant city of Lagash. This of course was probably incredibly embarrassing for the city of Uma, its main rival. So at first Lugal Zagesi conquered the old city of Uruk and the other city of Ur before finally moving on to Lagash defeating it in battle, crushing the city and plundering it, raising it to the ground and looting its temples of all of their treasures. And there you have it, perhaps the first instance of imperialistic conquest in history and what we have as the first kingdom in the way we see it, not just a city-state. The reason why I've said that there are no empires yet is because with the region of Sumer it's a bit strange. Sumer is like I said a region and nothing more than that. It's just a general title given to a collection of city-states that existed within the spheres of influence and trade of one another were interconnected and despite their rivalries depended heavily on each other not just for trade but for contact for business and also for religious reasons seeing as each city had their own representative Sumerian god however now I come to the point where imperialism first enters onto the world stage. Up until now, no empires. The biggest form of government you had was a kingdom. You had kingdoms, you had city-states. Not much more than that. Until a city that until now has not been touched upon at all. A city in the far north of the Mesopotamian region, known as Akkad, would rise to prominence and bring about the end of the early dynastic period of Sumer. But I am not going to go into the empire of Akkad at this present time. So for now, let's just look at the legacy of Sumer and its city-states. Now, it's a bit strange. You could paint the legacy of Sumer as literally everything. 
everything that you see around you today, seeing as it was the first collection of the first cities in history. An example that would be followed for millennia to come, that's still being followed in our world through the time freed up from a new agricultural lifestyle, we have sophisticated systems begin to develop. Economics, mathematics, craftsmanship such as metalworking, weaving, amongst others, the first use of bronze as a useful alloy in order to make tools and craft weapons, leading to the first wars amongst the first city-states. Concepts and ideas that still trickle down to our societies in the modern era. Urbanisation, planned cities, economics, geometry, mathematics, architecture. It all stemmed from these first cities. But, at the same time, you can also paint the legacy of Sumer as rather small in comparison to other great periods of time and other cities, nations and empires that would follow long after Sumer vanished from prominence, such as that of Rome. But, for now, I'll leave it there. Thank you very much for listening to this podcast. This has been my very first podcast as part of a little project I like to call the Grand Portfolio, part of um, getting more knowledge out there, starting with my favourite subject, history. This took... Well, let me just say that um, researching Sumer was quite difficult to say the least because... There's only tidbits of information scattered about. It isn't as well documented as later civilizations that would come into play. But yes, you can see that the legacy of Sumer never really quite stopped or ended. It never really stopped as it's still being used today, even though the region's golden age did. So the legacy of Sumer has never stopped, if you look at it in the bigger perspective of things. It never stopped, and therefore neither has knowledge, so why should you? I'm Lewis of The Grand Portfolio, and thank you once again for listening.